Welcome, my name is Dr. Bill Lynn. I'm a consultant in infectious diseases and today I want to talk to you about how I think about patients with infections and how I assess the acutely febrile patient coming to the emergency department. What I'm aiming to uh, cover in this session is how to recognise sepsis. I'm not going to talk about sepsis in great detail, how to manage sepsis, that's better done by intensivists, but how to recognise it, how to choose your antimicrobial therapy and what to consider when your patient is not responding to therapy. So we're gonna base this on a real patient to start off with, who's a woman I looked after a few years ago, who's a 36 year old who has no significant previous medical history, and she comes to casualty with a 48 hour history of fever, sweats, and vomiting. So if you look down at the bottom left, bottom right of the uh, slide, the first question I ask myself is, is this an infection? And where is the focus? So if we look at the information that we've got for this patient, it's most likely by far that it's, it is an infection. We know that non-infective causes can sometimes lead to fever, but what this girl has is she has fever and sweats. She has a documented temperature of 38.6. She's got some signs in her abdomen with a tender right flank and her renal angle. Her white cell count is not particularly raised at 6.7, but has a high neutrophil percentage of 93.4%, suggesting bacterial infection. And she's got a positive urine dip. So it's not difficult to come to the conclusion that she's infected. The focus is in the urinary tract with likely, right, likely upper tract involvement on the right flank. So a common clinical presentation. So on the next slide, you'll see in the next two questions I ask myself is, has she got sepsis and what antibiotics are we going to give her? And as you can see here from the results I've highlighted in green, physiologically she's stable, she's got a blood pressure of 115 over 74, slightly tachycardic with a normal respiratory rate, she's alert and orientated, she has normal renal function and a normal lactate. So she doesn't have sepsis. Does, do we need to give her antibiotics? Yes, she's got clear evidence of infection and upper tract renal, renal disease is something where we need to give treatment urgently. So what happens with her? We treat her empirically, because at that time we don't have microbiology, with the antibiotics augmented and amicacin. Now your antibiotic choice will be dependent on your local antibiotic uh, guidelines. At our hospital, this is our choice for significant community-acquired urinary tract infection with potential upper tract disease, with amicacin there to cover um, resistant gram-negative organisms. Now on day two, she's still spiking temperatures up to 39 degrees, but she's physiologically stable and national early, wo early warning scores around about two to three, indicating that she's not developing significant sepsis. We now have confirmation of the diagnosis with positive blood and urine cultures for E. coli, which are resistant to amoxicillin and trimethoprim, but sensitive to other antibiotics, including augmentin. So on day two, we're not particularly worried about her. It's common for patients with pyelonephritis to continue to spike temperatures uh, for two to three days on antibiotics. However, on day three, there's a clear deterioration. She's still febrile, but now her blood pressure is 80 systolic, her pulse is 128, her respiratory rate is 25, and this gives her a new score of seven. So a significant deterioration new score, which should mandate urgent action. Uh, she has a chest x-ray, which is not very much changed, and her blood tests show a further increase in her white cell count to 16.4, but she now has an acute kidney injury with a creatinine of 170, and she has a white cell count of 16, and she has a lactate of 6.8. So I think the question is, does she have sepsis? Yes. Um, do we need to change the antibiotics? I'll just throw that one out. So if we go on to the next slide, we're looking at the things that will help you make a decision about sepsis. And I've put two slides up here, two things up here, both of which are used internationally. So we've got the quick SOFA score with the graphic at the top, and then the UK NICE guidance underneath. And these focus on three things as being the most important determinants of whether your patient is developing sepsis. One is the blood pressure, with under the Q sofa a systolic of less than 100, and under NICE a systolic of less than 90 being severe. Altered mental state, um, which under the, under the NICE guidance stresses the fact of a history of an altered mental state from a relative or a friend. This is based on the fact that people have been sent home from the emergency department who were originally confused and disorientated at home, but have improved after a little bit of fluid or oxygen. And of course, a raised respiratory rate. Now these three factors are the ones that are most closely associated with the poor outcome. And if you have two out of these three, this means you need to take action. 
It means you need to review your diagnosis, initiate therapy, and escalate the care level for the patient. So if you're in the community, send them to hospital. If you're in hospital, upgrade them to the next level of care and get proper assessment going through. But on the next slide, as you see, if you look at those things, they're not unique to sepsis. So you do need to consider the other causes. So causes of confusion, hypotension, breathlessness, or acidosis. So particularly, for example, in the patient with underlying cardiorespiratory disease, you need to assess actually, is there a cardiological cause of a low blood pressure? Is there a respiratory cause of a raised respiratory rate? But the important thing is if they're developing two out of those three, you need to be assessing and thinking for sepsis. So going back to our patient, why is she doing badly? Well, the first thing is we might just not have resuscitated her properly. This is a common problem on, on general medical wards where people start the infe infection treatment, but they don't give adequate amounts of fluid and other forms of resuscitation. However, in our patient, not only is she not doing well physiologically, but she's still got a high temperature, her white cell counts deteriorate, her lactate's gone up. So it's probably not as simple as the fact we just haven't given her enough fluid. Have we got the wrong diagnosis? She's got an infection, but it's not pyelonephritis, or actually is it a non-infective cause, you know, such as a vasculitis? Well, I think both of these are unlikely because we've got clear evidence of infection. Have we got the diagnosis correct, but the wrong antibiotics? So has she got antimicrobial resistance? Well, that can develop quite quickly, um, but we're only 48 to 72 hours into her admission, and we've got blood and urine culture showing a sensitive organism. Could she have more than one infection? So in other words, we're treating a pyelonephritis, but there's something else going on. That's pretty uncommon unless you've got an immunocompromised patient. Are we failing in delivering our antibiotics to her? Well, this is a common cause of treatment failure in the outpatient setting when people are on oral antibiotics, but she's on intravenous antibiotics. And as long as we check the drug chart and make sure that she's received those, I don't think we need to worry about that. And then have we got a complication of therapy such as Clostridium difficile or an allergy? I think that's pretty early in her course for, for uh, that to have to manifest. And we'd have known if she had an acute penicillin allergy quite early on. So I think all of these are possible but unlikely. The most likely cause, of course, is that she has a hidden focus um, of infection, a sequestered infection such as an abscess. So our action in this case was to urgently image her. And as you'll see from the top graphic here, which is a cross-sectional um, CT scan, what we found that she had was an obstructed kidney due to a, a, a stone um, impacted, um, uh, which was causing a massive hydronephrosis. So this girl is not going to get better unless we intervene. She has a percutaneous nephrostomy placed. She drains cloudy urine, which subsequently grows E. coli and she gradually improves over the next 48 to 72 hours. Unfortunately, there was very little residual kidney function in that kidney, and the urologist decided to remove it at a later stage to prevent any further episodes of life-threatening sepsis relating to that. So progressing on, this really takes me to what are our priorities for treating sepsis and life-threatening infection? Well, the sepsis six, which I'm not covering in this talk, and you'll all be very familiar with, really focus on the first two, which is physiological support, so it's about getting your best physiological support, oxygen, fluids, and then if necessary, inotropes and pressors, senior review, critical care support if patients are not responding. And you need a priority window over within an hour of recognizing the sepsis to have that up and running. And antibiotics, you're a best empirical choice, depending on the clinical setting, again, within an hour. But I think inadequately um, stressed, I think sometimes, in guidelines is source control. If your patient's not doing well is to look, is there an underlying focus that needs to be physically dealt with in order to gain control? Moving back to antibiotics, uh, my top tips for that is number one, try to make a clinical diagnosis because all antibiotic guidelines will be based on the site of the infection. So have you got pneumonia? Have you got skin and soft tissue infection? Have you got central nervous system infection? Sometimes you can't do that and we have to deal with sepsis of unknown origin, but try wherever possible to make a clinical diagnosis. Assess the severity of the patient and reassess that on a regular basis as patients um, are undergoing treatment. Refer to your local guidelines, which are usually body specific and body site specific and organism specific, but will be adapted to what is, if you like, the ecology of your local setting. Ask for advice when uncertain. And in terms of catches, just remember recent microbiology results. Sometimes patients have got drug resistant organisms and those are known about already, but they're not spotted by the people who see the patient when they come in acutely. Underlying host factors such as immunocompromise, 
and travel on unusual exposures. And then, of course, finally, when dealing with antibiotics, don't forget drug interactions and allergies. You must always ask yourself those questions before prescribing. So how do I think about my patient when they come in? So I'm going to do all of that. I'm going to think, what's the severity of infection and what's the site of infection? And that comes from taking a good history, examining the patient. Don't forget to examination the pa examine the patient and look at those initial tests that are available to you. And then ask yourself this one question, what is different about this patient? If my patient has got pneumonia and underlying cystic fibrosis, my antibiotics are going to be very different to if they've got pneumonia and they don't have cystic fibrosis. I'm probably going to have to ring up the cystic fibrosis treatment center and say, look, I've got your patient. What do you want me to do? So just ask what's different. Is my patient immunocompromised? Have they traveled? Are there other issues going on with that patient? And so I'll give you a couple of quick examples to finish off. So the first one here is a very straightforward clinical picture. This woman's got cellulitis of her right upper arm. You know, if the history doesn't exclude, it doesn't involve scald or, bone, or burn exposure, that's all this can be. Her observations I'm showing there shows no evidence of sepsis. This is very straightforward. We're going to give antimicrobial agents directed to skin and soft tissue infection, uh, penicillin based unless the patient is allergic, in which case it'll probably be a drug like clindamycin. However, the real results with this patient are shown on the next slide and show that she had evidence of severe sepsis. She's hypotensive, she's breathless, she's got a raised lactate and a kidney injury. You very rarely see that with cellulitis. And if I see that with a cellulitis patient, I'm going to ask myself, is this actually a toxin producing staphylococcus or streptococcus? Has she got toxic shock syndrome? That will change my treatment. I need specialist advice. We may need to give drugs such as intravenous immunoglobulin. Or actually, do we have an underlying necrotizing fasciitis, where one of the hallmarks of that is that the sepsis and the severity of the illness is out of proportion to the clinical features when you look there. And there I'm going to need imaging and I may need surgical intervention. On the next slide, I'll show you another patient who presented to our care with sepsis, but on examination, she's got a vasculitic rash. So if I've got somebody with sepsis and they've got a vasculitic rash, I'm thinking, well, is that due to the infection? So has she got something like meningococcal disease? Is it because she's got infective endocarditis who get a vasculitic rash? Or actually is this non-infectious and the patient's got a systemic vasculitis? This patient had positive blood cultures for Staph aureus, had mitral regurgitation, and had endocarditis. And if you don't recognize that early in the presentation, you're not gonna manage that patient pre uh, properly. And finally, in the COVID era, here's a very nice COVID looking chest X-ray with a diffuse pneumonitis in the patient presenting with hypoxia um, to casualty, which at the moment, if we've got COVID going on, we're going to be thinking that that's a pneumonitis. But this is a number of years ago. This patient had unrecognized and undiagnosed HIV, and this is pneumocystis gerovacchiae pneumonia, or PCP. On the other hand, if the patient was HIV negative and perhaps had a severe acute kidney injury, this could equally easily be pulmonary hemorrhage relating to an underlying systemic vasculitis. So you need to consider those things and keep a wide view on your patient if they're presenting in a slightly atypical and unusual way. So to summary, therefore, my teaching messages here are assess severity, monitor your patient. Intervention is urgent if sepsis is present. But most importantly, approach every infected patient as an individual. Make a clinical exam, a di a diagnosis, examine the patient. The clinical context is critical. Travel, immunocompromise, all of those things are important. Look for a deep focus of infection. And then when your patient is not responding, think, reassess the patient, ask yourself those questions and take things forward from there. Thank you very much for your attention.